so, so good to me Before I took a breath You breathed your life in me well, Good morning. We're so glad you're here to worship with us this morning. Let's look at our sermon title and passage today. How do you handle your everyday faith decisions? How do you handle your everyday faith decisions? We'll be in James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26. If you will, take your Bibles and turn to James chapter 2, verses 14 to 26, and we'll read through those. What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm and be filled, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without the works and I will show you my faith by my works. You believe that God is one, you do well. The demons also believe and shudder. Let's stop right there. Did you know even the demons who are fallen angels, did you know that the demons also believe in God? There's a lot of people running around going, I'm a Christian, I'm a saint, I'm a follower of Christ, I'm a believer, whatever term you want to use. I'm a believer. I believe in God. Did you know that even the demons believe and tremble and shudder? So they know who God is. But it's not just saying that, yes, I believe there's a God out there. It is salvific faith where you say, I am a sinner. I agree with God in the fact that I have fallen and missed the mark. I have missed the mark of his holy righteous standard. And so I need God. I need a Savior. And so we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ through the gospel, which is Jesus Christ come down from heaven 2,000 years ago, died on the cross, was dead and buried for three days, according to the scriptures, arose from the dead on the third day, and then over 500 people saw him, and he ascended from their presence into heaven. That's the gospel. And so to believe in the gospel is to have salvific faith. Demons, fallen angels, do not have salvific faith. They believe in God. There's a lot of people around our world and in churches that believe in God, but not salvifically. That's the difference. You can believe in God and go straight to hell. Are you hearing me clearly? You can believe in God and go straight to hell. It is a faith and a trust that you have called out to God, as Paul says over in Romans, where he says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. There has to be the believing in the heart and the confessing with the mouth that he is Lord and that he was raised from the dead. And the Bible says that whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. You can't just say, well, I believe there's a God. And I'm going to go to heaven. You might as well pack your bags for hell. Because you're not going to heaven. And so that's what he's talking about. He's trying to say there's a lot of people believe in God. Or believe there's a higher power. You're going straight to hell. According to the scriptures now. This is not Baptist theology. This is the Bible. Looking in verse 20. But are you willing to recognize you foolish fellow. That faith without works is useless. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? You see that faith was working with his works, and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. Also means completed. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, And Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, and he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone. In the same way, was not Rahab the harlot also justified by works when she received the messengers and sent them out by another way? For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. Now listen to me. He's not trying to indicate that you have to do good works in order to be saved. No one can just do good works in order to gain the favor of God. You cannot just gain God's favor. We have sinned against him. We have fallen. We're in depravity. We deserve hell. But when we come to that God and we say, I'm a sinner. I ask for your forgiveness. I ask for your salvation. I ask for you to save my soul. He will. And so what he's trying to say here is he's giving two stories, real life stories. 
Abraham and Isaac, and also Rahab and the messenger spies that came from Israel. So there's two stories here. What he's trying to say is, when you come to faith in God salvifically, you just come by belief and trust. You come and you just say, God, I cannot save myself. I'm asking you to save my soul. Now, once you're a Christian, you start on this path of living for Christ. As you live out your real faith, then there needs to be works coming from the faith that you've already obtained by believing, by asking for God's salvation, which he gave to you apart from works. What the author here, James, is trying to imply is that once we become a Christian, then there should be good Christian works and service coming from your faith. But how many Christians do you know, like I know, that they claim to be a Christian, and I was baptized at a certain age, and I go to church, and whatever, but you look at them and you don't think they're a Christian any more than a monkey riding a bike. You're looking at them and going, really? You're a Christian? I can't tell. Are you sure? You know, there's been people that I know in ministry that I wanted to share the gospel with. I'm talking about in Christian ministry, been ordained. And I wanted to say, I just wanted to share something with you. Do you know the gospel? Jesus Christ down on the cross. Like, what are you talking about? I'm like, because I can't see it. So coming from your Christian faith, your salvific faith, you should be doing good works that are stemming from, coming from your faith. Now listen. This is going to be a little bit of theology for you, so listen to this closely. We're going to talk about some Latin this morning. No, normally you don't get Latin from me, but you need to hear these phrases in Latin. Sola fide. Sola fide. That is Latin for justification by faith alone. You can only come to Jesus Christ and be saved by grace alone, not by doing good works. Sola fide. That's Latin for justification by faith alone. Sola scriptura. Sola Scriptura, that is Latin for by Scripture alone for Christian faith and practice. There is no other way that a Christian is called by God to live out their salvation faith, their Christian faith, other than by just living through Scripture. There's no other work. It's only by Scripture. Sola Gratia, Sola Gratia, Latin for salvation by grace alone. Now here's how my seminary, Dallas Theological Seminary, put these together. Salvation is by faith alone, through grace alone, plus nothing. Isn't that catchy? Isn't that a great way to remember it? Salvation in Christ is by faith alone, through grace alone, plus nothing. Meaning you can't add any good works to it to be saved. You cannot gain God's favor. Now, here's what we want to do. Look at this next slide. What this author is trying to say is if you come to God and you say you have faith, but there's no works, the text says, how can that faith save you? That faith is of no good. It's like a dead person in the morgue with the little tag on your toe that says faith. Just because you say you have something doesn't mean you have it. How many times have you ever told somebody that you buy them lunch and you're going to go out and you buy the lunch, you get up to the counter and you don't have a $20 in your billfold. You thought you had $20 in your billfold, but you must have spent that somewhere else. Just because you think you have something doesn't mean you have it. But if you truly have it, shouldn't it be used? Right? If you truly have something, shouldn't it be used? There are two types of people in the world. Those that do not have faith in Jesus Christ and are not saved, and they're trying to do good works, trying to be good moral people, work hard, give their shirt off their back, and be kind to people. They're trying to earn God's favor. And they're hoping that there's a balance sheet approach at the end of life, that God's going to look at life. And I I can't tell you the number of people in my 23 years of ministry, and I've said, what's going to happen to you when you die? And you stand before God in judgment. And they'll say, Well, I'm just hoping my good outweighs my bad. They're just kind of in this limbo land. The judge is going to come out, all rise, and then be seated. And he's going to sit down in his black robe and his gavel, and he's going to call you up to the bench, and his bench is super high and huge, and you're this little bitty petite person standing in front of him. And in his towering, godly, heavenly voice, whatever that sounds like, is going to, he's going to be flipping pages, and I mean a lot of pages if you lived 100 years. He's going to be flipping a lot of pages and go, no, you barely made it. Whoo, yeah, no, you're sweating it now. Oh, I made it. Woo, dog, I made it. There's not going to be any of that. Do you know what I would say if I was to come before Christ, standing before him, and God was to say, Bruce, why should I allow you into my heaven? First thing I should say is you shouldn't because I'm a sinner. I have sinned against your holy, righteous standard. I deserve hell. You shouldn't allow me into heaven. But 
but you gave your son Jesus Christ to die on the cross, and I put my faith and trust in him as you commanded, and I believed in him, so you should let me come in only upon the blood of righteousness of Jesus. He said, that's a correct answer. Come on in, my son. I've got nothing, nothing to stand before God and say, this is why I should get into heaven. But salvific faith should lead to a practical faith life. Do you agree that a Christian that says, I have faith in God, there should be evidence of your Christian faith pouring out of your life daily, right? Otherwise, we have a faith that is dead. I want to tell you, I want to read you something that's very interesting. Go back with me in your mind's eye. Go all the way back on the linear calendar for time in our earth. Go all the way back to 1746. 1746. Many of you have heard of Jonathan Edwards. Let's go back to 1746. Now, by the way, when he makes this statement, he is in the middle of the first Great Awakening. A revival in the United States like you have never seen. He's in the middle of this at 1746. Now, to be in a spiritual awakening and make this statement... What would Jonathan Edwards say in 2018 America? Listen at what Jonathan Edwards said, and this is in his uh, work, Religious Affections, in 1746. As gold that is tried in the fire is purged from its alloy, all remainders of dross, and comes forth more solid and beautiful, so true faith... So true faith being tried as gold is tried in the fire, becomes more precious, and thus also is found unto praise and honor and glory. So what does he say about true faith? True faith has got to go through a purging process. It's got to go through the fire. It's got to be smelted. It's got to be hot. The heat's got to be turned up under your faith for all of the dross and the alloys to be pushed out to where you have nothing but pure gold, pure faith. A lot of us want this easy believism faith. We want to come to faith in Jesus Christ, and boy, everything is going to be great, and boy, God is just going to bless us with everything in the world, and it's that, you know, health, wealth, gospel kind of a message a lot of preachers preach. That's not according to the man that was used so primarily in the first great awakening. He said, no, when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, you now have salvific faith, but for it to grow For it to have substance, for it to have strength, for it to have life-changing power, for there to be real godly works come out of it, it's got to have the fire turned under it. God takes your faith in him and puts it on the stove. And he turns up the heat. How many of you enjoy that part of your life? No, we don't want to. You remember, go back to James 1 as we're walking through this book of James together this month. He said the very first chapter, James chapter 1, verse 2, Consider it all joy, brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith. God's just putting a Bunsen burner under your faith. And he's cranking up the heat. And he's cranking up the heat because your faith is also in a mixed walk with your sin nature. God has given you a salvific faith, but for that faith to grow and be sanctified, strong and steadfast and durable, he's got to turn up the heat. Now that's what... Jonathan Edwards said in 1746. Now listen to Dr. Henry Blackaby in 2018. This was tweeted last night by Dr. Henry Blackaby, who's in his 80s, I believe. This is a great man of God. Jonathan Edwards was a great man of God. Listen to this. To remove all the dross of sin requires purifying fires to be stoked to an intense heat. Saintly service which is good works, saintly service, which is works, most often flows from great affliction. If you want to be an on-fire Christian and be used by God in a mighty way to bring a lot of good fruit to Him, you got to take the fire. you got to take the Bunsen burner. you got to take the heat because God is one. What happens a lot of times, though, when we go through our trials, what do we start doing? Complaining and blaming and We're not going to church as much. We're not reading the scriptures, not praying as much, right? And so we're just not taking God's path. And God said, look, consider it all joy, brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the faith testing of your faith produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result that you'll be perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. All he's doing is refining, purifying the Christian faith you asked for when you came to faith. Because you must have a faith that's going to go through affliction and that through that affliction you endure and you're able to be an outstanding, strong Christian. I'm going to show you something. Maybe a little visual will help you. How many of you are familiar with Alka-Seltzer? 
right, for allergies, those kind of things. You know, it kind of stops all the allergic reaction. All right, so let's just say that the faith, did you know that faith is tangible? You can't see it in your life, but did you know that faith is tangible? It's tangible. It's real. You may think, oh, it's ethereal. You know, it's kind of in me. I just kind of believe. It's just, faith is real. If you don't have real faith, you're in real trouble. Right? But if you have faith in Christ, you have a real faith. And over in Ephesians 5, when Paul is talking about the husband and his wife, and he's talking about uh, discipling his wife, you wash her with the water of the word. You wash her with the water of the word. So we got the word of God, which is implicated as water. you got your faith. And you've got the word of God, you've got the water. Let's just say you have these two, and you're going through life, and you have trials, and you're trying really hard, right? And you're rolling up your sleeves, and you're giving it all this elbow grease, and you're trying, and you're praying some. That's what most Christians do. How far are you getting in your trial? Nowhere. Word of God's here, faith's back here. Nothing's happening. You're just trying really hard every day, and really you're just hoping and wishing things will turn out. But the water of the word... And the faith is back here. Now let's just say you go another step and you say, I have to mix my Christian faith with the Christian word. Now we have something going on that the faith is with the word. Right? That you're coming to God and saying, I'm going to really study your word. You remember also in James 1? It said, but whoever lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives generously to all without reproach. If you want to mix your faith with God's word and say, I need your wisdom. Would you reveal your wisdom to me as to how I need to handle this trial? He said, I'll give it to you generously, but let not that man ask doubting, but only in faith, because the doubter is seen as an unstable man, tossed to and fro. So even if you did this, and now you're trying to get your trial on, you know, and you're trying to grow in your faith, you still haven't done anything. You mixed your faith with the word of God, you're sitting down, you're studying, you're praying, but you haven't applied it. You haven't applied it yet. You're still back out here with good works. Why didn't just the study of the word of God in my faith I'm seeking God. It's called obedience. It's called obedience. The way God purifies you is for you to say, okay, I obey. Now, you're taking in the word of God unto obedience. So when you start walking us now, God takes over. God takes over. Do you see the difference? I've been having this out as a little plaque that sits over on that table under that TV screen. Many of you have seen it. Let me read it to you. Faith does not make things easy. I think when we think I'm a Christian, just because I'm a Christian, why don't I have it easier than the lost person? They don't know God. They're going to hell. How come I've accepted Jesus Christ? How come I don't have it easier? Faith does not make things easier. If you've been a Christian more than 25, 35, or 40 years, I guarantee you if I were to ask you, has your Christian faith made your life easier? Everybody would say no. But watch this. It makes them possible. Faith does not make things easy, it just makes them possible. Nothing is impossible with God. The Bible says nothing is impossible with God. You know how many things are impossible with you? Haven't we already seen how many things are impossible with us? But when you take faith and you take the water of the word of God and you mix them together and you ingest and obey, now you've got the God who sits in the heavens who has indwelled you by the Holy Spirit helping you do that impossible task. You can't do anything impossible. And most of the things that come into your life are impossible. And there's a lot of things we quit on. You know why we quit? Because we just can't do it anymore. We just don't have it in us anymore. And we just quit. We just give up. Well, that was never God's intention. He said, consider it all joy, brethren. Look, he said, don't worry about the trial. I've given you faith. I'm your God. You're saved. But you've got to walk the word. You've got to study. And you've got to obey. Consider it all joy, brethren, when you encounter various trials. It doesn't matter what kind of trial. Various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith, all I'm doing is what Jonathan Edwards and Dr. Henry Blackaby have said. I'm just testing and refining and purifying your faith so that you'll become perfect, complete, lacking in nothing. So what's God's desire? You're going to conquer this trial. Guess what? Another trial is coming. And then he's going to help you conquer that trial. Guess what? Another trial is coming. What happens over here? Another trial's coming. But if you take God with you on the journey, then you're going to end up conquering every trial. Here's my last analogy for you. It really amazes me to watch trout. Have you ever been somewhere in the Northwest and you've watched trout? How do trout swim? Do the trout go downstream? They go upstream. They go against the current. Now check this out. A full-grown trout, 
starts down at the base of the mouth of a river, and they work their way up all of those rapids, all the way just fighting and fighting and fighting, and they're having to get away from bears because even when they jump over some certain places, bears are out there trying to grab them. They're trying to go all the way back to where they were first spawned. That is what's in their DNA. They're having to fight, 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 fight. Well, what do you think about people in our world? Are we wanting to roll with the current, or do we like fighting against the current? Well, everybody I know likes to go with the current. Let's just go downstream, man. Let's don't go upstream. We want to go downstream, not the trout. The trout knows that I need to go upstream, and it's an uphill fight his whole life until he gets miles up at the river's head. And so that's where the female is going to make the nest, and she's going to lay her eggs, and then the males are going to fight over her, and then they're going to release their sperm, and hopefully those little eggs are going to actually become little trout. And then guess what? When they're young, they're just making their way back down because they're young. They're just kind of going with the flow. But those same baby trout, they're going to end up being at the very bottom, and once they're mature, when they're mature, they start to make their way. They learn how to not stay in the easy parts of the river. I've got to go back and here's my trek. Here's what i got to do. When you're saved and you're a baby, you're going along with the river a little bit. But God is growing you and he's starting to show you how to conquer some of your trials. But God is always saying the Christian faith is going uphill. Uphill. Trout go uphill. Trout go upstream. Tr trout fight the current. Christians fight the current. We've got to go uphill. But you've got to do it by faith. And most of our faith can't take it. Because we don't want the fire. We don't want the heat. We don't want the pressure. But the only way your faith can make it is to be sunk deeply into the word of God and then ingest it and obey it. And every time you do what God says, your faith is strengthened. It's more purified. It's more strong. And you keep working back the way up. You know what happens when the trout, after they get all the way back up, you know what happens? They die. Did you know that's kind of what it's, life, it's like for a Christian? You're going to fight the currents all the way back, all the way back through all of the pitfalls and all of the bears and everything all the way back up into the freezing winters. You've got to get all the way back to the back just to die. You and I are going to fight our whole life going all the way back upstream the way God has told us to fight the currents, and then we're going to do what the Apostle Paul said back in the first century. He said, I have kept the faith. I have fought the good fight. I finished the course. He's saying, I did it. I did it all the way back. Amen? So you've got 2,000 years ago, you've got the Apostle Paul saying this. 1746, you have Jonathan Edwards saying this. And then in the 2000s, you have Dr. Henry Blackaby saying this. All the great men of God are saying, hey, faith is active. Faith has works. Faith has to have fire under it. Faith has to have trials to kind of pull it apart and kind of make it stronger and really make it what God wants it to be. Faith doesn't just grow on its own trials or what help your faith become strong so that you can be a powerful Christian and bear a lot of fruit before you get all the way back up the current to the end of the river and die. That is biblical Christianity. That is biblical Christianity. Is that what you're seeking? Or are you bought into this Americanized Christianity? Oh, it's all gravy, man. Just God gave his son to die for you on the cross. You believed in him. Now you have Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. God's kind of a genie in your little body, and you get three wishes. And whenever you got a hard time, you just kind of start praying harder, and you ask God to bail you out and just kind of help you with this. And all of a sudden, God doesn't come through. Now you're angry and blaming God and blaming other people. Now you have a sour attitude. Now you're angry. Now you're unforgiving. And so your faith just is waning down here. There have been people that have been Christians, and their faith, has not grown at all in 35 years. Because they have had an Americanized view of Christianity, not the biblical view from the first century and in the 18th century with Jonathan Edwards or in the 21st century by Dr. Henry Black be talking about that your faith has to be put under fire. Next time you encounter a trial, you know what you do? Put a corner smile on your face and go, thank you, Lord. I know you're about to do something. Thank you, Lord. I'm considering it joy encountering this various trial I got a new trial evidently you're about to bless my faith evidently you're about to purify my faith hey something's good about to happen hey I'm about to become a stronger Christian this trial is going to help me we always think trials are negative raise your hand if you've always thought trials are negative they're not good they're not fun they're not helpful they're not they're good trials and troubles and tribulations are good right because God says they are and that's how he grows us. Matter of fact, 
A football coach would tell you the same thing. When you go out and practice every day after school in high school or college or even pros, every day you go out and play. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. You practice, practice, practice. What are you practicing? You're hitting, you're hitting, you're hitting your own teammates, right? Iron sharpening iron. Why? Because you've got to get ready for game day. You've got to get ready for Saturday and Sunday, right? Because that's when you're going to get hit. Did you know that that's why two-a-days? Two-a-days are some of the roughest things you could ever imagine. When I was in high school, they were three-a-days. Three-a-days. You had offensive, you had defensive, and you had special teams. And so it'd be like 100 degrees outside, and you're in pads, you know? And so, but to be a better football player, you've got to go through the trial. Right? If you're going to be a better student, you've got to roll up your sleeves and study, maybe even to the midnight hour and burn the midnight oil. Whatever you're going to, if you're going to be a, a more stronger person, you've got to go to the gym and you've got to lift a lot of weights or you're not going to be any stronger than you were yesterday. You can't just buy the gym membership. There's called pumping iron. Right? And you're sore, your muscles hurt, you're tired, you're achy, you're taking Advil. But then when you go in the gym the next day, you lift five more pounds because you have worked out your spiritual muscles, you have worked out your faith. Here's what I want to encourage you to do this week. During your quiet time, and we say we have our quiet times, spend more than five minutes with God before running off to your job or before running off wherever. Just sit there and just say, Lord, what state is my faith in? Do I have real faith, real salvific faith? And if I do, are you pleased with the works and the fruit and the service that's coming out of my Christian faith? If so, praise your mighty name. Sing some praise songs and go to your office or school but if not if the Holy Spirit is saying man we've got a lot of work to do here I really need to pur uh, purify and and purge some of the things in your life because your faith is not standing strong your faith is not standing out your faith is not doing good works for my name you're not accruing anything in your life that's going to bring more glory to Jesus and the Heavenly Father we need to purify that faith it's gotten kind of weak and grungy and dungy and it's just kind of in the dirt and it's not really helping anything oh you're saved and you won't go to hell but that's about it so a christian really wants to love god walk with god honor god please god glorify god bear fruit for god isn't that true well then if that's really what you want and we say we want to be christ-like if that's what you want you're asking for the fire you're asking for the fire because that's how he does it do you want to grow this week do you want to be more used by God this week? Do you want God to use you to bear fruit that will last for all eternity? That's his desire too. If that's your desire, that's his desire. Just know the trials are coming. Just know the trials are coming. And listen, the trials are okay and they are good and they will bear fruit. Bring them on and just let God help you through them. Amen? Let's stand and sing praises to God.